All right. I told you guys that there's something special about Demeter and Dionysus, and I labeled it as them being Earth deities. But I didn't really get into what that means. Okay, so it's important for us to get that in terms of internalizing the significance of these gods. You need to talk about Apollo and Dionysus together. By, by the same token, you need to teach Demeter and Dionysus right real close to each other. They really have a lot in common with each other. Next time, we're going to do Apollo and Dionysus together, and I think that's the most logical way to do it um, for reasons that will be clear to you. So as far as what we mean by an Earth deity, the way to understand what that means is, first of all, to connect it to the, in English, figure of speech, down to Earth. So when we say Earth deities, on the one hand, obviously, they're related to the earth in a direct way. So you talk about Demeter being the goddess of the grain, and you talk about Dionysus being the god of wine. Both of them have in common that they come from a particular plant that was especially important to the Mediterranean in general and to Greece in particular. Okay, so on a literal level, that's true, that they are earth deities. But even more significantly, on a cultural level, there's the symbolism of what an earth deity means. It means, like I just uh, intimated, um, down to earth in the sense that they are a lot more, like I told you last time, relatable um, than the other deities, than the s sky deities, especially Zeus and maybe even Apollo. And then, you know, of course, Hades, even though he's under the earth, he's no more like an earth god than any of the Olympians are, per se. Okay, so, so yeah, Demeter and Dionysus are called Olympians, because as I told you, they have permanent abodes up in Olympus, but... They are traveling all the time. They're itinerant deities. They're, they're traveling from one place to another on Earth and, you know, mingling with human beings in disguise constantly and making sure that the kings of the various places that worship them are preserving their worship and allowing people to worship them. Okay? Now, that should raise a question for you right away. Why wouldn't they allow people to worship them. And it has to do with a very interesting concept that for some reason I have a sense you guys resonate with, because in our society people talk about these kinds of things a lot. This idea of secret societies, underground societies. Okay, And that's exactly the way we should think of Demeter and Dionysus. They are the figureheads of religions in and of themselves that were offshoots of the traditional state religion of the pantheon of the Olympians. Okay, So on the one hand, they are officially part of the canonical 12 Olympians, but on the other hand, they were worshipped much differently than the other deities. And it's not only a matter of the fact that they were worshipped separately from the other deities, but how in fact they were. And if there's one word that summarizes the difference, it's women. Okay, uh, Bombshell here. All right, I didn't even hint at that before, but it's, that's, that's really important to understand. We're talking about a society, and especially as time goes on into the classical period of Greece, the heyday of Greece that is featured in those coffee table books at Barnes & Noble before it goes out of business, where you know for $7 it's supposed to be $50, and on the cover it says it's $50, you're going to get it for $7 because nobody's buying it, whatever. Um, you know, those kinds of books, the glory that was Greece and all that, that period which is supposed to be the most enlightened period of Greek history, was, ex unless you count women, in which case it was one of the most unenlightened periods, I think most would agree, in Western history. Women had absolutely no say over their own selves, let alone any kind of political influence, let alone power. You know, forget about voting, forget about holding power, how about just not getting killed by your husband if, he, if he's pissed at you? Stuff like that. So it's just a fact. It's a fact that is ugly, and it's a fact that you have to contend with and be honest about if you're going to get in this field. You can't whitewash it. There's no two ways about it, okay? It really is, in the West, the beginnings of a kind of institutionalized misogyny, okay? Uh, patriarchal stuff, all that stuff you, you hear about, it all began there in ancient Greece, at least in the West. I'm not going to get into Eastern stuff about all this, okay? So the question is, what do women do? Okay, they have to legally sit in the home and do housework, make clothes, and raise the children, and they are not allowed to go out into, say, the theater once it arises in, in the classical period, aren't allowed to go anywhere that the husband doesn't want them to go, which pretty means, which means anywhere outside of the household. And it's hard for us to stomach this stuff, but the more you read Greek history, 
there's, there are two things. Number one, the more you read about this being routinely taken for granted um, by the Greeks, including some of the more, more um, supposedly um, you know, evolved writers such as Plato, Aristotle, you know, taking for granted this is a natural thing uh, for women to be this so-called inferior gender, etc. cetera. Um, and then even maybe more disturbing is the kind of cavalier manner in which these things are talked about. You know, it's just, it's a guy made a joke out of. And women are constantly um, compared to children when it comes to how they, sh you know, men should treat them in, in society, etc. Email me if you want a million examples of this, okay? Um, so, that being said, okay, since this is a mythology class rather than a culture class per se, that's about all we're going to get into um, uh, when it comes to that stuff. If you're really interested in that stuff, take one of the culture classes and, and we get way into it. Um, but for now, it's just uh, important to, in connection with mythology, to point out that there were outlets for women in society, underground outlets. There were alternative religions in particular, okay? And they fell under two main categories, okay? They both had in common that they were earth deities that they worshipped, and the other thing they had in common is that the deities that they worshipped were grounded in nature, in agriculture, in a sense of reality, you know, like as reality as you can get, kind of the opposite of the rarefied abstract notions that you get from thinking about and worshipping uh, sky deities, okay? So there's a real interesting and important symbolism at work here when you're talking about the sky gods and the earth gods, and the earth gods being the um, gods that were worshipped more, way more commonly by women than men. Okay? It wasn't a matter of half and half. Um, it, was, it was more like 80 to 85, 90% women and maybe 10% men. Guys like Euripides, um, the tragedian, who, who wrote tragedies talking about the plight of women in society, etc. Okay? There were those on occasion. So we're going to start with Demeter, and then next time we're going to get into Dionysus. Demeter and Dionysus have in common that they are offshoots from the other Olympians, but they were founders of their own mystery religions. It's called mystery religions, these underground religions that we'll be talking about. And today, if we have time, if not beginning next time, we'll segue into it. We're going to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of a mystery religion, what it meant and how it served mainly women, but also slaves and convicted criminals. That's pretty much the three categories of Greek society that were served mostly by these underground religions. Okay? Now, the paradox here is that we will talk as much as we can about these mystery religions, but it'll be a very quick amount of time that we spend on it because... As you probably know, and if you've seen Fight Club, you know, because that's kind of a modern version of a, of a mystery religion, the very first rules of Fight Club, number one, you don't talk about Fight Club, number two, you don't talk about Fight Club, right? Remember that? If you saw Fight Club, which is an amazing movie if you haven't seen it, um, <clears throat> Fight Club was about a mystery religion. Okay? It, there were a lot of aspects to it, and there has been scholarly analysis of Fight Club. That guy, Palinik, he's well-versed in ancient history, obviously, because there's a real mystery religion resonance to his novel and to the movie they made out of it. So we'll talk a little later about what a, a mystery religion is, but we're going to lead up to it. There's another aspect to Demeter in particular. So today, starting now, I'm going to get into Demeter in particular and, and, and stop generalizing about Demeter and Dionysus. Next time is Dionysus. Another aspect of Demeter is the etiological component of her worship. And I already told you guys what etiological means, okay? That's an adjective meaning having to do with the cause of something, the reason for something, you know, the source for something, where it comes from, why something is, okay? And that component will be nature-related, and it will be an explanation of why it is that one season of year everything dies. In other words, why do you have a winter every year? If you think about it and you read Hesiod's Theogony, the focus from the very beginning is on permanent fixtures in the cosmos. Okay, You're talking about the earth. She's always there. You're talking about the sky. He's there. You're talking about the ocean. Always there. On and on and on. But what about aspects of nature that are temporary? You know, Things that are cyclical, that come in and out of phase, appear and then disappear over and over and over. You know, Talking about the rhythms of life and all that kind of stuff. You kind of get a hint about that with the name of Rhea, uh, which means flow, and then uh, kind of implying menstrual flow and the idea of that, but not very often in Hesiod. With Demeter, you have the symbolism of a whole part of the year pretty much being on hiatus from growing agricultural stuff. And so the myth surrounding Demeter is an explanation 
of why it is that we have a winner every year. Now, where does this myth come from? It comes from the longest and probably most important of a group of kind of mini epics that were composed after Homer, but so close in style and to, to some extent in subject matter to the Homeric epics that they are called the Homeric hymns. Okay, so Homeric is an adjective meaning Homer-like. It doesn't mean necessarily, it can, but it doesn't only mean of Homer, okay, the way you, you say um, American has to do with actually being American, right, rather than America-like, like Hellenistic means Greek-like. So the third and final period of Greek history is Greek-like, not, not um, Greek. Hellenic is Greek. Hellenic, Hellenistic. Okay, so they're different. Okay, we remember going back, we had Uranus, and then the next stage of the succession myth was Cronus, king of the gods, and he and his sister Rhea had a bunch of children who would eventually become the first brood of the Olympians. Okay, so her name comes from a really early form of Greek that goes back to Linear B, which is from uh, the Mycenaean period. The Homeric epics seem to have gone back to a poetic tradition leading all the way back at least to the Mycenaean period. And that's what we're talking about here. So I told you guys that in the Mycenaean period of Greek history, you know, on that day that we did the overview of Greek history, that there is a script that we have that Michael Ventris in 1953 deciphered. And unfortunately, for the most part, there's nothing in the way of literature. It's mostly inventories of palaces and things like that. But every blue moon, there will be a mention of something dedicated to one or another, apparently, not for sure, but probably, God or goddess, because we're talking about really early forms of these names for the, for the gods. So it's assumed that the name Zeus shows up. It's assumed that the name Demeter shows up, and it's assumed that the name Dionysus shows up. Those are the three, as far as we can tell, earliest of all the gods that show up way before Homer, hundreds of years before Homer in Linear B. And who knows, one day if Linear A is deciphered, they might show up there as well. Okay, so what does that tell us? It tells us that there's no correspondence whatsoever, chronologically, between when the Olympians became part of the Olympian pantheon and how far they go back in influencing um, the course of worship within Greece. Um, in the case of Demeter, it's closer, because you, you guys will remember that Demeter was part of the first brood of uh, Olympians, you know, after Aphrodite, um, uh, whereas Dionysus not. Dionysus was the 12th and final of the Olympians to join uh, in, in the, the canonical 12. Nevertheless, he goes further back than almost all of the other Olympians, except for Demeter and Zeus. So her name comes from Day, which in almost every language from the Indo-European tree, it means from or of, you know, like De Donde Eres Tu in Spanish, where are you from, of where are you from. So it's, it's really cognate with that day, believe it or not. It goes all the way back there, okay, and it's in, in, in Greek and in, in Latin as well. Okay, so it means of what? Of the mother, Mater. Okay, so it doesn't mean meter in the sense of measuring. She's a mother goddess. She's a goddess that goes all the way back. And obviously, not only nature, but the idea of the mother will be some of the earliest, if not the earliest, of the deities. But the obvious reason that without mothers, there would be nothing, right? You know, that's where everything comes from. Her domain, you know, what she worships over, the area of her worship more than anything else, as you know, as you all know, she's the grain goddess, okay? Grain and harvest. So she's the goddess dealing with grain, the importance of agriculture, things growing from the earth, a kind of extension of Gia. We already have Gia near the very beginning of the universe, and now here we have another deity who's associated with agriculture and all that. Yeah, for sure there was a connection between Demeter and Gia. It's just a matter of once you get past the original entities of the universe, okay, and then the deities that follow them, and then on into the Olympians, you have to account for the whole gamut of experience of life um, within the pantheon of Olympians in one way or another. And so there needs to be kind of substitutes for the deities that originated um, before the Olympians did. And a good example of this is Demeter taking over the, pretty much, taking over the functions of Gia herself, with the big difference that once you get into the Olympians, the, the, the gods and goddesses take on more of what we would consider to be human-like personalities, and they become characters and stories, as opposed to Gia and Uranus, who don't. You know, we think of them a lot more abstractly, 
Okay, yeah, they had sex together, but that's about it. Okay, we don't know anything else about what they did. We just know that they made it. Um, and then all the other kind of intrigue stuff that went on in order, for example, for the Titans to be able to be born from the Earth and then the Olympians not staying in the belly of, of Cronus. But other than that, which is pretty cool drama, admittedly, you don't have much in the way of personalities and you know distinctive personalities to those deities. So Demeter takes over from Gia in her function, but maybe more importantly, she also takes on a kind of personality of her own that distinguishes her from the other Olympians, such as especially the virgin goddesses, Hestia, Athena, and Artemis. Sometimes associated with Rhea and Gia. And I talked about Rhea, her name, flow, associated with menstrual flow. Um, so you have Gia, Rhea, and then Demeter is the next. Uh, so they think of that as a kind of a lineage of importance in connection with the idea of a mother goddess. Okay, Beginning with Gia, moving on to Rhea, and then on to uh, Demeter. Okay, She kind of takes the torch um, from uh, Rhea and uh, Gia. Now, quite interestingly, and this is something else that links Demeter with Dionysus, not only is Demeter a vegetation goddess, just like Dionysus is, okay, she's in charge of grain, whereas Dionysus is in charge of the vine, okay, grapes, okay, but also we have to kind of particularize Demeter's domain within agriculture to incorporate not only food that sustains people's survival, but also psychotropic dry foods <laughs> right? um, that are kind of the dry equivalent to wine. And the most famous example of this is the poppy, the poppy flower, the poppy pod, as a form of intoxication, and whether it be ritualistic or um, simply for psychotropic uh, pleasure. Okay? And so everybody talks about Dionysus being the god of wine. Not many people talk about um, Demeter being the goddess of the poppy. Okay. Now, some of the sources that talk about uh, the poppy, which, as you guys know, in the modern age is used to manufacture heroin, but before that, opium. And so you have some of the sources that mention um, the poppy and its connection with Demeter being connected with this idea of the worship of, Di of Demeter in the mystery religion, and that's part of the ritual, um, ritualistic aspects of it. Kind of might remind you of some, um, say, Native American rituals that you might have heard of with ayahuasca, etc. Okay, so that's kind of the idea here. All right. So you know, there's a lot to say about that. We won't spend forever on it, but it's interesting to know that that's a connection between Demeter and um, Dionysus. You know, one is dry, the other is uh, liquid, but they're both um, psychotropic substances that they are in charge of. And when we get into Apollo, we'll talk a little bit more about that stuff in connection with the uh, priestess of Apollo. It, like in the movie 300, you remember that scene where she's dancing and stuff? That's what we'll get a little more into. Okay, now, just like we talked about different Olympians that we've covered so far, owl-eyed Athena representing her wisdom. Okay, Epithet, as I told you guys, is a nickname that Homer most famously uses to describe one or another of the gods and or heroes, uh, mainly to give himself room metrically to, to be thinking about what he's going to say next while he's using these formulae. And so bringer of seasons, for very obvious reasons, once we get through the story, and if you've already done the reading, you already know um, why she's called that. And not only is it women who mainly worshipped both Dionysus and Demeter, but it's also people from the country as opposed to people from the city. So there was some, there was a connection there with people who lived in the country not having as much money as those in cities. So there's a connection between economic status and how likely someone was to worship Demeter and Dionysus as well. Okay, kind of one step away from Hephaestus. I already told you guys how you think about Hephaestus as kind of the underdog god and people who work with their hands, who were stigmatized in society, thought of him as their main patron god. You know, Hephaestus would, let's just say, would, would be able to chill with uh, Dionysus and, and Demeter. You know what I mean? Just in terms of thinking about their, their personalities, okay? Whereas someone like Apollo wouldn't. We should also obviously think of Demeter not only in terms of providing food and you worship her in order for agriculture to do well, farmers to have a good yield for the year and all that kind of stuff, but also pulling the camera back in a, in a bigger picture, the very idea of settlement in the first place, the idea 
of the need for agriculture in order for people to settle down in communities and not be nomadic, but rather to create settlements and then eventually city-states. So she's a goddess associated with that as well. As far as various attributes, they're very predictable. When we talk about Zeus and the thunderbolt, that's predictable. He's the sky god, and that's where thunder is and lightning. We talk about Poseidon, the trident, very predictable. You have the sea and fishermen using the trident for spearfishing, etc. Same thing with Demeter. When you try to identify that it's her in coins, in wall paintings, in vase paintings, you're usually going to have some sort of motif that is agriculturally related other than grapes. Grapes Dionysus has a claim to. But other than that, it's pretty much going to be Demeter. Okay, so you see the importance of her, right? And you know, when you get down to it, in a very real sense, she's one of, if not the most important of the gods, and hence her primordial nature, you know, going as further back maybe than any of the other Olympians. The idea that without things growing from the earth, um, we're dead. You know, we, we can't survive. Okay, we need food in order to, to live. And so various types of food, especially grains and most pictorially conspicuous, corn. Okay, so corn is just so easy to identify. So quite often, wreaths of corn are iconography associated with her. And then, and then another item, object associated with Demeter is a torch. Okay, it's, it's, it's a matter of to be able to see when she goes into the underworld to save her daughter. Uh, which we'll get into later today. Okay, so the idea um, of the torch and the need to uh, illuminate her path in order to find her daughter who's been kidnapped. And in this case, unlike with Paris, maybe, um, we're definitely going to use the word kidnap, uh, as well as maybe rape, uh, when we talk about Hades in connection with who we'll be getting into now, Persephone. Okay, and then finally, as far as animals are associated, we learned that, for example, the owl is associated with Athena because of its associations with wisdom. And then later you're going to find out in the semester when we get to Heracles that definitely the lion is the sine qua non, the without which you don't recognize Heracles wearing the lion's headdress. This is not as much the case with Demeter. You know, every once in a while should be depicted with animals because, as you know, Artemis is the one that is mostly associated with animals, wild animals. But just to get across, just to underscore her connection with primordial aspects of nature, um, it makes sense that the animals associated with her are ones that we associate with wildness, okay, such as snakes and pigs, you know, that, that kind of get into the idea of the mysterious aspects of life, the other, the, the hidden, the secret, the below-the-earth type vibe. Uh, of, of animals. Okay, so that's what she will be associated with. So, so hopefully you're ready, just by describing who Demeter is, getting a sense of how fit she is to be the figurehead of a mystery religion, of an underground religion, a religion that, as you'll see, as far as anyone knows, because like Fight Club, no one really talked about it, but as far as any leaks uh, were able to escape the Telester, Telesterion, that is the main building where, where what went on in the um, Eleusinian Mysteries, her religion that we'll get to in a little bit, went on. Um, as far as we know, it had to do with um, ideas of dealing with the afterlife and the mysteries of, of life and death and things like that. Okay, So think of her that way. Think of her as a, just, just like Dionysus. And, and it's connected to this idea of the consumables, right, the foodstuffs, the agricultural products, associated with both her and Dionysus, being psychotropic, changing the state of the mind, that's also connected to the idea of the mysterious aspects of their worship. You're getting my drift. You're getting, these are real interesting figures that the Greeks were quite aware veered off from the other gods and goddesses that tended to be a little more on the side of rationality, justice, things like that. You know, we talk about Zeus and the god of justice, the god of protecting guest friendship, um, Apollo, the god of poetry and reason um, and light, not quite the sun god, but things like that. Here we're in a whole other region. We're, we're in the kind of what Pink Floyd would call the dark side of the moon, okay, the other side of the moon. Not this side, but over there, the side that we don't know about. Eventually, the story of Demeter, the Homeric hymn to Demeter, is the main source that we have, just like the Theogony of Hesiod is the main source we have for the beginning of the universe and the succession myth. We learn from her story that there will be one particular place very close to Athens that will be the main center of her worship. But that being said, unlike Zeus, who's associated with one place more than any other by far, Olympia, unlike Athena, 
associated with one place by far more than any other, Athens. Same thing with Poseidon and Corinth, okay, et cetera, et cetera. With Demeter, and again, pretty predictably, because of the importance of agriculture everywhere in Greece and the unifying factor of needing things to grow from the earth in order for anyone from any part of Greece to continue uh, surviving, it makes sense that her worship um, would be a lot more ubiquitous all over the place than all but Dionysus's worship. Okay, so that's another thing they have in common, Dionysus and Demeter, is that their worship is all over the place. Yes, there's one or two places that t comes to be associated more with their worship than anywhere else because of their individual histories. And, and like anyone else, if they did things in certain places, those places are bound to be considered most important um, in their histories. But other than that, they are the most universally worshipped of all of the Olympians, even Zeus. Okay, so in, in Athens, Athena was the chisel. Okay, in Athens, right? Not not Zeus. Doesn't matter that theoretically he's the king of the gods. It's all about Athena. Okay, when you're in um, the other ones I said in Corinth, it's all about Poseidon. Okay, when you're in Olympia, it's all about Zeus. When you're pretty much anywhere else, it's all about whatever god or hero is the main patron god goddess or hero of that place, plus always these two, Dionysus and, and Demeter. Okay? It's, it's nothing to memorize. It's just understandable because everybody has to eat and everybody has to drink wine. Wine still is the water of Greece. Go to Greece and tell me I'm wrong. They're all drinking wine all day, all night. Okay? It's water there. It's a fun place. They have a lot of fun there. Now let's get into her story from the Homeric Hymn to Demeter. It all begins, of course, with Zeus and his horniness. And he finds yet another, yet another, yet another, to have sex with and to have a child with. And that child, in this case, is Persephone, and that mother is Demeter. Yes, his sister. Okay, nothing new. Hera's not so happy about this, right? Okay, so she's pissed off. So what is Hera going to do? That's the first thing that should pop in your mind. As soon as you find that Zeus is going behind her back with someone, and this will become even more conspicuous once we get to the heroes, okay, but once, once Zeus goes with anyone other than Hera, you should be asking yourself, what the hell is Hera going to do to throw a wrench in the works and make things more difficult for Zeus and for the child of Zeus? In this case, how do I put it nicely? I can't put it nicely. Zeus pimps out his daughter, all right, to Hades. It's a screwed up ish. And this is the king of the gods. Are you getting an idea of the paradoxical nature of the ancient Greek conception of the gods that they worshipped? There's no two other ways to put it, okay? So what happens? Hades says, I'm lonely down here, Zeus. Yeah, I went along with this stupid drawing lots crap after the Titanomachy. But now here I am all alone. You're up there with Hera having a good time. Yeah, she's pissed at you here and there. You go behind her back, and she gets back at you. But not directly, for reasons that you made clear in book one of the Iliad. But, you know, you're happy. All right, Poseidon, right? He's down uh, on the earth level or up on Olymp in Olympus having a good time. You know, everything's great. But here I am all alone down here, and I need a wife. And Zeus, without hesitating, says, Ah, oh, I'm going to give you my daughter. Okay? You can take, you can take uh, the daughter of me and Demeter. Okay, so how does it happen? Very simple. One day, this girl is out there in the field picking flowers that happen to be a particular kind of flower called the Narcissus flower. And it has to do with that guy, Narcissus, who got so enamored with his own beauty, his own physical beauty. Think about Paris, okay, kind of the archetype for Paris. He got so enamored with his own face that whenever he looked at himself in static water, in, in some kind of pool, he would lose himself in it to the extent to where one day, and then there's various versions that say it had to do with him being punished and having to do it, whatever. But the bottom line is he becomes so hypnotized by his own beauty that he falls into the water and drowns. Okay, that's, that's narcissist for you. And that's where the notion of narcissism comes from, this idea of getting so into yourself that the whole world revolves around 
uh, yourself and you think that in one way or another it does, okay? So she's picking those flowers. So I mentioned that, and these are a lot of details that I won't mention and that I don't mention in the book, in order to show you that that's the way that the Greek, at least narrative mind, works. Every once in a while there will be details and descriptions of things that will illuminate aspects of the story in an indirect way. Okay, so it's not very, it doesn't say something like, you know, hey, pay attention to the fact that it's Narcissus flowers that she's picking. All that the author, whoever it is, of this Homeric Hymn to Demeter says is that she's picking Narcissus flowers and this is who Narcissus is. Other than that, we're, you know, reading in or not reading in as much as we wish or not wish. Okay, but as you could probably guess, a lot of interpreters of this story have made a big deal out of the fact that it's the Narcissus flower that is uh, pointed out as the one that she's picking. So she's picking these in the field, and then out of nowhere, from a cleft in the earth, from below, comes up in a chariot, Hades, from the underworld, comes and swoops down and grabs Persephone, having been given permission by Zeus to do so. Grabs her into her chariot, goes back down in the underworld, and that's as much kidnapping as you can get. And it was Zeus who allowed that to happen. And that moment of Hades swooping down and kidnapping her is one of the most frequently depicted moments in myth for whatever reason. That has been considered, you know, has exercised the imaginations of various artists throughout the ages. Okay, this moment of Hades swooping down and grabbing Persephone. Real famous Baroque sculpture by Bellini, etc. All throughout the ages. Okay, so Demeter from far away hears this distinctive scream of Persephone doesn't know where she is, so she goes all over the earth looking for her. And as she does so, as the days go by, she becomes more and more distraught, more and more emotionally effed up. And what that causes is slowly but surely things to start dying, the earth to start dying, the agriculture, the, 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 the plants on earth to die as a reflection of her emotional state. Okay? So that's, that's her domain and her contentment has been a reflection of the um, lack of what we will now retrospectively and spoilerly refer to as winter. But before that, when there was no winter, everything was great. But now this distraught nature of her emotional state will cause things to start dying and, and, and things are terrible. Okay. Here we go again with Helios. Helios... Just as in that story of, among others, among many others, um, Helios being the guy who lets Hephaestus know that it's, uh, that it's Ares that Aphrodite is going behind the, his back with. So now Demeter learns that it's Zeus and Hades who are responsible for this latest development in Persephone's life. So now Demeter splits, leaves from Olympus, pissed off. So she was searching the earth, couldn't find Persephone, and then finds out from Helios what's going on. And now she is going to, as far as she's concerned, leave Olympus for good. She's pissed off enough at Zeus, the king of the gods, that she decides she's going to go to the earth and stay there forever because she prefers people to gods, is the idea. And Dionysus will have a similar kind of uh, revelation, okay? She disguises herself as all the gods have to do. All the Olympians have to disguise themselves in order to interact with people. Otherwise, they will be blown away by the awesomeness of their demeanor, okay? She goes a place that is a long, long walk from Athens called Eleusis, and that's going to be the place that her religion, her, her mystery religion, is named after. There will be processions from both Eleusis to Athens and vice versa, once the mystery religion is established. Okay, so she arrives in Eleusis, and as in all the settlements, there's a king, because we're talking, and this is important to remind yourself of, we're talking here in the Mycenaean period of Greek prehistory, we're talking about a society where all of the settlements, as far as we know, were ruled by kings. Okay, we have monarchy everywhere. This is going to be really important to remember, and uh, when we spent that whole day on ancient Greek history, kind of dealing with the different periods, you will remember that eventually, because of the change in economic stuff mainly, you led from monarchy to tyranny and then from tyranny to democracy, with quotes around it. All right, so we're in Eleusis, and the name of the king is Celeus, C-E-L-E-U-S, and there are various 
it's almost like a travelogue, this uh, Homeric Hymn to Demeter, uh, as she travels to Eleusis, the places that she um, passes, etc. There's one landmark that still exists that you can go visit if you go to Eleusis today, and that is referred to as the Well of the Maiden, the landmark that you can visit today. All right, so what Demeter does, now why does she do all this? Why does she go to Eleusis? She's looking for Penelope in one moment, and then she's going to Eleusis in another moment. What's going on? All that it mentions, it doesn't really try to pick up any pieces when it comes to logic, but the idea is that she wants to spend some time at Eleusis. As far as she's concerned, Penelope may be gone forever. So now she has her maternal instincts kicking in, and she wants to do something to compensate for her lack of her daughter. And so what she's going to do is she's going to go pretend that she's a human nanny, and try to take care of the king and queen's son. And what happens is, Celius is the king, Metaneira is the queen. Metaneira one day catches Demeter holding their son and putting him into a fire, and obviously thinking that that means that she's trying to hurt him, not knowing that Demeter is a goddess. Whereas in reality, what Demeter is trying to do is something similar to what Thetis tried to do, with Achilles by dipping him in the river Styx when he was born, and that is to make him as immortal as possible. And, and so, obviously, Metaneira is going to misunderstand this, and what she does is she orders Demeter to stop doing it, and Demeter, in a way that is very common in these stories, doesn't care that Metaneira doesn't know she's a goddess. She takes that as an affront to her godhead, as they say, to her godliness, and makes her pay for her disrespect at yelling at her for doing something that is, after all, only trying to help her son. Uh, so so that's, the, that's kind of the paradox here. She's trying to help her son, but there's no way the queen can know it because she doesn't know that she's a goddess, dipping her in the fire in order to achieve some, something close to immortality for her son, uh, for the prince. So as a form of payment for what Demeter takes as Metaneira's affront to her greatness. Demeter forces the people of Eleusis from that moment not only to worship her, okay, this is where we start getting into the ideological component of the story, okay, so this is where the idea of a religion devoted specifically to Demeter comes from. So now she tells the people of Eleusis, your queen really screwed up, you guys, okay, she reveals herself to be a goddess that no one knew she was, you know, after the fact. But now that she reveals herself that she's a goddess, she tells everybody, because your queen screwed up by screaming at me for trying to help her son, she should have known better. She should have known. She should have had the intuition that I, a goddess was trying to help her son. So what if you didn't even, if she didn't even know I was a goddess? Okay, that doesn't make logical sense, but that's the way it is. Okay. You, people of Eleusis, are going to have to compensate for her oversight by worshiping me and by building me a temple. And this temple still exists in its foundations. Archaeologists are amazing in being able to reconstruct this kind of stuff. So if you go today, unfortunately, it doesn't even look anything close to this. But that is how originally it was supposed to have looked. And in this building, called the Telesterion, that's the name of the building. And you can see the foundations of it today if you go visit. It's kind of, kind of trippy. And that's where the rituals of the mystery religion devoted to Demeter take place. Now, beyond that, the idea is that just like Fight Club, you're not supposed to talk about it. And amazingly, throughout the ages, and it was hundreds and hundreds of years, that um, this mystery religion called the Eleusinian Mysteries, named after Eleusis, makes sense, right? The Eleusinian Mysteries. The goings-on were pretty much kept under wraps, except for a few details that we'll get to after we finish this story. Okay, so Demeter is still distraught about her daughter, and this was, it turns out, this was kind of a um, by, byway in the story. This was a little, you know, her trying to compensate for missing her daughter by helping out the um, child of the king and queen of a place close to Athens. Why? Because Athens is telling the story and they want a place right next to Athens to be the most important place in the story. The way when we get to the hero Theseus, Athens will be the center uh, of the story. So that's pretty common. Now, once all this reason for her being worshipped separately from the other Olympians um, via 
the Eleusinian Mysteries is established, now she goes on continuing looking for Penelope, hoping that she'll be able to. Okay? She was unsuccessful in immortalizing Celius and Metanera's son, and so now she's going to keep on looking for her own daughter. And as she does so, she gets more and more sad, and now the things that were dying die completely, and now you have what we would call the dead of winter. And the people of the earth can no longer hack it, can no longer stand it. They start praying to Zeus and to Apollo and to the rest of the Olympians, the sky gods in particular, and asking them for relief from this horrific experience of everything dying on the earth. Because at this point, things go on even longer than, than one season. And, and so what do the Olympians do? They listen to these prayers, and Zeus finally realizes that he has to do something about this. He has to help out Demeter. So he sends Hermes to the underworld to let Hades know that he can no longer keep this up, and that because Persephone is down there in the underworld, Demeter, by extension, is so distraught that everything is dying on Earth, and now all the people are going to end up dying because there's nothing for them to eat. Why the hell would the Olympians give a darn about that? Internalize it, you guys. That in and of itself is the reward for the Olympians, the fact that they need to be glorified. Hello, and we, we pick on celebrities with their whole celebrity culture fame cravings, right? That's where it all comes from. The Olympians need that, right? If the gods that you pray to are obsessed with everybody glorifying them and, and, and worshiping them and sacrificing to them in one way or another, then how can we pick on the celebrities for caring about all that more than anything else? Or even ourselves for envying celebrities who are so famous and rich and this and that. You know, that's where it all comes from. It's interesting, right? There's no other reason whatsoever for the gods giving a darn. Um, whether or not people worship them, okay? They don't need any food, although, yeah, human beings show their worship for them by sacrificing dead animals, and it's the savor, it's the smell from the burning animals that pleases the gods. So to some extent, there's a sensual aspect to it, but it's more than anything else, um, the very idea of having some other form of life separate from them worship them, look up to them, Okay, and then a lot of psychologists, starting with Freud or even further back than Freud, get into the idea that what's going on with that? What's going on with that, to, you know, among other things, is this idea that the gods won't realize how great they are and how important they are unless there's someone beneath them to point it out to them, to hold up a mirror to them and say, you are so much greater than we are and we're beneath you and we make you, you know, bolster you um, by doing so. Okay, interesting stuff. So Hermes goes down in the underworld, not surprisingly, based on the little bit that we talked about about Hermes. Okay, he's the guy of transitions. He's the traveler. He's the messenger. So he goes down to the underworld in order to get Persephone out of there. And Hades says, okay, Persephone can split. Because Zeus told me that I have to let her go, so I will let her go. One-fourth of the year, she has to keep him company in the underworld. Other than that, she gets to go up and everything gets to grow and Demeter gets to be happy. Okay, so it's, it's a reflection of Demeter being happy when Penelope is... It's kind of sweet, right? Demeter's happy when Penelope's on Earth. When she's in the underworld, Demeter is very sad. Okay, and everything dies. Yeah? Four seasons. Four seasons. She eat, okay, so, so the idea is that, um, who know, the, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, first of all, like I told you, a lot of people have different interpretations of this stuff. So there's four seeds that she eats. Does that mean that that's the equivalent of eating one out of four? Does that mean four out of 16? You know what I mean? There's a lot of people debating about this kind of stuff as far as the numbers go. But the fact that it's four is supposed to remind us of the four seasons. Okay, and one way or another, even though she eats them all. Okay, so, so in other words, we we don't know. We don't know how to read that. Okay, so do we read that as wait? She ate all four, so Hades is compromising and saying, "Go ahead, um, you know, she's not. She doesn't have to stay here for all four seasons the way you would think I would make her do because she ate all four, but rather one four. You know, nobody knows how that works. All that is said in the story is she ate four seeds, therefore. Um, Hades said she has to stay for one-fourth of the year every year. Okay, So your guess is as good as anybody's. And people do write articles about it trying to explain it. So it's good that you're confused because everybody's confused. Right? It's just, it's just a... It's, now why, why is it kind of 
Why does it make sense that there would be these details that everybody's arguing about? And really, it's kind of misguided if you think about it in this context. It has, it's a connection. It's um, a reflection of this notion of everything associated with the meter and the Eleusinian mystery being mysterious and being unfathomable, fathomable, right? un, un, um, interpretable. Okay? Um, there's a lot in the air about why things are in this story more than any of the others, which are pretty straightforward. You know, the thing with Uranus pushing down heads and coming up, that's very easy to understand, right? It's out in the open. It's all sky god stuff. Now we're in the earth god stuff. Anybody see the movie Blue Velvet uh, by David Lynch, 1986, maybe on video or whatever? Um, yeah, very beginning of the movie. It starts out beautiful, you guys. It's a, you should probably find it on YouTube. It's just really cool. It all begins... And it made a big impact on a lot of uh, filmmakers and stuff, because it was nothing like it ever that, uh, before it came out. Um, it all begins with um, a suburban scene um, with music, old music from the 50s, real beautiful, nice, you know, kind of leisurely music. And everybody in the neighborhood of a suburb, beautiful sun, beautiful blue sky, one or two clouds or no clouds at all. And um, there's a fire truck going by, and the firemen are waving in slow motion, and everything's beautiful. And the camera is just coming closer and closer to um, this front yard of this, of course, white picket fence house and this and that. And the camera gets closer and closer. And as the beautiful kind of leisurely music uh, fades out, you get this intense hum kind of thing coming up. And as the camera gets closer and closer to the grass, and even then you're still thinking, oh, that's beautiful, beautiful green grass. It gets closer and closer and closer. And then, boom, it gets down to the grass level and then goes beneath the grass and even goes further and further. And by this time, all you hear is this, you know, like horrible um, sounds. No more of that beautiful music anymore. And it goes deeper and deeper. And now, all of a sudden, you're seeing a bunch of, like, worms and a bunch of, um, you know, uh, bugs all fighting with each other. And all that kind of stuff. It's just terrible, terrible. And then, boom, cuts you out of it. And then you're in this movie where... On the surface, it seems like everything is the way you would expect it to be in this kind of suburban neighborhood, but you're already trained for the rest of the movie to expect things that are not so out in the open, um, you know, average and, and normal. You know what I'm saying? That's kind of the vibe you get from everything having to do with Demeter and Dionysus. There's always danger. There's always mystery. There's always uncertainty involved. And so it has, in my opinion, something to do with why there are all these weird uninterpretable details. So that's that's the thing to get. That's the thing to internalize from the worship of Demeter and Dionysus. And that segues very beautifully into the fact that it was mainly women who worshipped these deities, okay, in an underground way. You had to believe in the state religion and the gods that were considered to be the most important, but you could partake in the Eleusinian Mysteries just for 10 days out of the whole year. But that's not what was going on. Okay, as far as the affiliation of many, we don't know how many, women in society, that was their main thing. That was their main worship. And there was this kind of sisterhood in Greece that was associated with the Eleusinian Mysteries. And unfortunately, I mean, it's one of the most maddening lack of um, documentation that we have about something. We, we just don't know anything more than just kind of these really little enticing hints, you know, that there was this kind of underground thing going on with women but it's not surprising that if anything had been written by women about these things or by men about these things, this is the kind of stuff, above all else, that didn't survive, that wasn't allowed to survive by those who determine what did get to survive. Okay? And that's another can of worms. It's related to everything in this whole semester. When I talk about how there are many, many, many variations of so many myths that we'll be dealing with in this class, on one level, that's a reflection of historical change and many, many artists taking these myths and mashing up elements from them, sampling them, etc. I'm trying to use, you know, modern contemporary analogies, you know, with, with using um, art that already exists and then doing new things with it. There was a lot of that going on with myth, okay? But there was more to it. It was also a matter of the fact that there was only so much stuff that was allowed to survive by those who had the power to preserve the literature. How did they preserve it? They had to have places to keep it, to store it, to um, preserve it. And there were. They were libraries, and there were very few of them. And most of them didn't survive for, for different reasons, mostly war and stuff like that. Okay. Now, we're going to get a lot more into that later on when we get to uh, the Hellenistic period 
in connection with JSON, like I told you, and, and other stuff like that. But it really does get a little bit depressing if you allow it to be, um, you know, how little we really know about ancient Greece and Rome. So the stuff that we talk about in here, I do my best, and also in the book, I do my best to limit what I throw at you guys to the things that are pretty unequivocally, unambiguously true, according to what we, we have. But even then, because the evidence that we have, the documentation we have, is so strictly controlled by the few who were able to preserve them for posterity, who knows how close our idea of what ancient Greece, especially Greece, but also Rome, but mainly Greece, was to what really happened. You know, it's, it's, it's both a challenge, if you're into that kind of stuff, you know, try to do the best you can within those limited parameters to interpret ancient Greece, but don't believe anyone who pretends to have a real comprehensive idea about what happened in, in Greece and Rome. We're really limited by not only the number of sources we have, but also the types of sources we have. They tend to come from, for want of a better word, aristocratic sources, you know, sources from people who had the power, who had the means to preserve things, not from regular people, people who might have written, who were just as educated as anyone else, and who may well have written things that just didn't get to be carried on into the future, into our laps to read stuff for classes like this. So, so we do the best we can to understand it, but you know, as time goes on, when you get into the Roman Republic and Empire, you have a much more secure sense that you have just as much a comprehensive idea about what happened as, for example, with the founding fathers of the U.S. You, know, you really feel like you're embedded in history. In Greece, it's really hard to get that sense you know, because of the limitation of the documents that we have available to us. Okay, so when we get something like the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, it's a giant deal, okay, because there are lots of iterations of it, lots of manuscripts of it, and they're almost all the same. So you have a really good sense that it's an authoritative document that was used by the ancient Greeks, and so that's why so much is made out of the details from it, including the details that are hard, if not impossible, to interpret.